The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to his disciples, Go into the whole world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak new languages. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he spoke to them, was taken up into heaven and took his seat at the right hand of God. But they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word through accompanying signs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for today's Feast of the Ascension, the key text is our first reading today from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. But actually, that's a little bit brief, given the next few verses that follow chapter 11, which really should be a part of this story, but the church cut it off at verse 11. So when you take all these verses together in chapter 1, what kind of story do we hear? Actually, it's a very powerful and important story for all of us because all of us in a similar way deal with what those apostles went through 2012 years ago. And what do I mean by that? Well, they had just experienced a devastating loss. It's hard for us to understand what it was like for them to lose Jesus. You see, these people had left family, they had left their possessions, they left everything to go follow him. And as one of the apostles said in Luke chapter 24, the famous road to Emmaus story, he says, we thought he was going to be the one that was going to set us all free. But he died the death of a common criminal. And that was horrible. And yes, none of them were there at the foot of the cross to witness his agonizing death. But they heard what it was all about. They knew it was like that. And, and, and so it was a horrible, horrible sense of defeat. So on one hand, they had just experienced that. And it was very painful and very difficult to get over. But then on the other hand, they began to look ahead to a time of promise and hope. But where the Acts of the Apostles comes in, this present reading today, they are in the in-between times. They've just had that loss. They are looking forward to a future. Jesus said, the promise will come to you. But right now, they're stuck in the in-between times. And you know, very often, we get stuck there too. How so? Well, the death of a family member, the death of a loved one, now here you are, married for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you wake up one day after the funeral and the other side of the bed is empty. The house is minus one important person. That hurts. You know, just recently I experienced that sense of loss uh, in the death of a, someone who I was very close to, a 94-year-old woman named Jane Newt. She lived over on the south side. And she was a very active person up until the last few years, and then all of a sudden her heart, her health began to deteriorate. The last couple of months, I was going to see her a couple times a week, and my favorite time to visit her was Sunday afternoon, late. I would go see her and take her communion. It was a delightful thing to be with her. She was a very holy woman. And then after she's dead and she's gone, you wake up one day and you look at the clock and the clock says four o'clock and you were always on the south side of four o'clock. And you're not there anymore. And then it hits you that you're not going to be born there anymore because they're going to sell her house. It's all done. So you see what I mean? It, it's a tough adjustment. You have that loss and it's very difficult. You just find yourself saying to yourself, what do I do now? 
Same thing happens with illness, sickness, especially if that horribly frightening word that begins with the C comes into your vocabulary. You know, there you were healthy, everything was going fine in your life when all of a sudden something happens, something goes off kilter. You find yourself waiting for a diagnosis to come and when it comes, it devastates you. You don't like that word that begins with the C. And then all of a sudden now, your life begins to change. Things are imposed upon you. Words are imposed upon you. Concepts are imposed upon you that you've never been through before. That's a tough, tough time. And then, very often, it happens when people take off because of college. I remember leaving in August of 1980 to go to the seminary in Baltimore. I left Logan. I really had never been out of West Virginia up to that point. My mother had died the year before, and the only thing I knew about Baltimore is that that's where you get Maryland crab meat, you know, and I love crab meat. And so there I am going to Baltimore, not knowing what to, what to do. Uh, some priest had ill-advised me. He told me, he said, you know, you just need a change of clothing. Everything else is provided for you. So I gave everything I had away. I kept $54, and I go to Baltimore with two changes of clothes only to find that it's a co-ed campus and it's like the University of Southern California. Everybody's got a car. I'd given my car away to a poor family and I thought they were going to give me my books. Well, my first semester books were 600 bucks. You can't pay those with 54 bucks and my looks just wouldn't convince the bookmaster to give them to me. So what did I do? I, I got out my rosary. In fact, it was the remote rosary that mom had on her deathbed. And I began to pray that rosary. And then another shock. I wasn't welcome to do so. That school at the time was so incredibly liberal. If they caught you praying the rosary out in public, they would write you up for being too conservative. So we had to go underground to pray the rosary. Fortunately, the Vatican investigated that seminary and straightened it out. But the one connection I had to mom, the one thing that gave me peace, I couldn't use publicly. You talk about homesick. And those of you who've ever gone off to college know what I'm talking about exactly. Austin Hickman over there got, set, got accepted this week to Notre Dame. And oh, he's excited. It's his dream come true. Wait till he hits the campus of Notre Dame. And it happens probably even more devastating with broken relationships. A best friendship, a marriage, someone that we trusted, someone that we loved betrays us, the relationship ends. That's a difficult loss to deal with. You find yourself wondering, what am I going to do next? I remember years ago, a young college student came in and, and she and her boyfriend of several years had broken up. They had done so many things together and their ritual was to work hard during the week so on Friday at 6 o'clock they were showered and ready to go out and have a great weekend together. And she says, now I look at the clock at 6 o'clock and there's nothing. Nothing. You know, that feeling of loss. You're in between and, 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 and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen next. So what did the disciples do? What did those 11 apostles do? Well, are you ready for this? Surprise, surprise, they pray. They pray. Now you may say to yourself, well, okay, that's nice, they pray. No, they pray, pray. We're told as soon as Jesus says, wait here in Jerusalem for the promise to come upon you, the 11 of them went to an upper room in Jerusalem and they gathered together to pray and the Blessed Mother was with them too. And we don't hear the content of their prayer, but they prayed intensely. And, and you know what happened? There was power in that prayer. You know, so people say to me, you know, Father, I, I'm in that in-between time. I feel kind of lost right now. I always tell them to pray. And then they'll say, after a period of time, but I still feel dry inside. I feel like God's not listening to me. One of the important things to remember about prayer, your personal private prayer is important, but we human beings are social creatures. 
We were meant to do things together. Look at this gathering here, a bunch of you from all backgrounds coming here to celebrate a baptism. We are social creatures, and so our prayer is meant to be a social experience. You know, one of the things I love about Mass, and when I see this church packed the way it is, is that I've got all of you all praying with me. We all may be praying for different things, but we're all praying together, and there's power and comfort when we do that together. Secondly, it's important to hear the message of simplicity that Luke gives us in this passage. Or to put it another way, to factor down to what really counts for me in this life. Or another word for it is humility. What's important for me? What really matters in this life? You know, when things have been stripped away from me, when my spouse is no longer with me, when my health is not what it used to be, when I don't have the job that I had for the past 30 years, and so on and so on, when that happens to me, I need to stop for a moment and ask myself the question, what is of value to me in this life? What's important to me in this life? What has meaning? You see, when your props that you put up under you have been knocked out from under you, through whatever the case may be, through death, broken relationship, sickness, you're faced with looking in the mirror at yourself and saying, who am I? What, what am I all about? When I take away the BMW, when I take away the house, when I take away all the other stuff that I've used to prop me up in life, what do I have then? What's important? What really matters? No, that's something we should be doing all the time. Going back to the basics in our life. But it happens one of two ways to us. Either we choose to make it happen that way, or we get the props knocked down from under us, and we're forced to become humble. All of you, I'm sure, have heard of or remember Boris Becker. He was a miracle tennis player. And if you remember, before he turned 18, he had won Wimbledon two times. Not too long after Wimbledon, he won it a third time. And then all of a sudden, to a shock to the tennis world, he just became detached from tennis. And people wondered why. And I did some research on Boris Becker to try to find out what was he thinking, what happened. I mean, the guy had the tennis world uh, by the hand. He had everything he wanted in the world of tennis. He was a god to so many people. And I come to find out, some people said, well, he's just an underachiever. He didn't, he didn't, he got scared by success. But that's not the case at all. I found someone who actually knew him. And here's what they write. Boris Becker suddenly realized at the height of his fame that he was becoming more than a famous world tennis champion. He suddenly realized that Germany was making him a source of its natural pride. And he found himself being idolized. And that is very seductive, whether you're 59, 29, or in his case at the time, 19. But for his young age, he said this, and I quote, the Germans wanted me to live for them. They worshiped too much. When I entered my own hometown, people stood there and gazed up at me as if they were expecting blessings from a pope. When I looked into the eyes of my fans at the Davis Cup matches last December, I thought I was looking at monsters. Their eyes were fixed and had no life in them. When I saw this kind of blind emotional devotion, I could understand what happened to us, our German people, a long time ago in Nuremberg, when thousands of people gathered for one of the first times to hear the young speaker, Adolf Hitler. And he said to them, heroes live very short lives. So he stripped himself of all those honors and stepped back from that kind of ambulation and the kind of personality cult that you read about in People magazine. He wanted to be authentically himself. Amazing. He chose to go back to what really counted in this life. And all the money, all the fame, all the glory, all the power he saw was making him something other than what he was as a person. 
and he backed off. And then the third thing that the apostles did, thanks to Jesus, he had planted seeds of hope in them. Remember his words before he ascended up to heaven. Wait here for the promise to come. That promise, of course, is the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is referring to. And so now, all of a sudden, the Lord had put something in their hearts that helped them have hope. Oh, it was difficult to hope because of all the devastation that they experienced at the death of Jesus. But hope is what they had. And what did it do for them? Well, it helped them to keep praying and keep open to the Lord and His promise. You know what, my brothers and sisters? That promise is everywhere in our world. But sometimes the loss that we have, sometimes the confusion, sometimes being so polluted with stuff prevents us from realizing that there's something bigger out there that the Lord wants. The Holy Spirit is still in the surprising business. He surprised 2,000 years ago and he surprised it today. And in some of the most amazing ways. I take you back for a moment to the year 1987. Now that blocks out about one third of the congregation this morning. In 1987, May 29th, I was sitting in a rectory watching the evening news at St. Paul's Catholic Church in downtown Weirton, West Virginia when a story came on suddenly, one of those breaking news things, that caused me to stand up and cheer. And here's what happened. We want to talk about the Holy Spirit and surprise it. A 16-year-old German by the name of Matthias Roost flew a single-engine Cessna airplane from Helsinki all the way to, anybody remember? Downtown Moscow, right in Red Square. He dropped gracefully to the ground a small single engine Cessna airplane in Red Square. Now you have to appreciate how he did this. He was able to get below Russian radar. He was be able to be able to escape the anti-aircraft batteries that were all around the city and high tech, I might add. He was able to evade all of that in order to land right down in Red Square. And you know what part of Red Square he landed? This is amazing. Right in front of St. Basil Cathedral. St. Basil Cathedral. Gorbachev was furious. How could this happen? It was an embarrassment all around the world. People were furious. The Russians were just absolutely beside themselves. Gorbachev fired many of the KBG top command. He fired many of the Air Force officers. It was a national embarrassment that this kid, this punk from Germany, flew a single engine plane right in front of, of, of Red Square, in front of St. Basil Cathedral. And you know what's interesting? Gorbachev and all the Russian leaders before him had convinced many of the Russian people that God was dead. That God was dead. Why well, believe in God? God's dead. He's no good. He's nothing. He doesn't exist. In fact, St. Basil's had been turned into a kind of museum of atheism. But guess what? The Holy Spirit said, I beg to differ, and so I'm going to have this 16-year-old kid fly this plane right in front of the cathedral. And you know what happened? Something very interesting, as only the Holy Spirit can do. A groundswell began, and religion in Russia began to grow again. Christianity in Russia is flourishing today, and it all began with Matthias Roos in his heroic attempt to fly to Red Square. Absolutely amazing how the Holy Spirit works. So let me tell you another story. A guy by the name of Edwin Booth, he lived uh, in the year 1865, and 
He was the Lawrence Olivier of the stage at the time. He was known around the world for his acting. But he had a very, very tragic life. He encountered many, many obstacles that would have caused most people to go screaming into the darkness. For instance, his father moved the family from their home in Maryland all the way to California so that he could work out there. He was an abusive alcoholic. He literally drank himself to death. His name was Brutus. And, and it was a horrible thing for the family because not only did Brutus Booth drink himself to death, but he bankrupted the family. So they had to work their way gradually all the way back to their hometown in Maryland. And that they did. That's what caused Edwin Booth to take up acting. And so he began to act. He fell in love with a woman by the name of Mary DeVille. She lived for two years after they said, I do, and she dropped dead of a heart attack. There he was, a widow at a young age. He remarried a year or so later to another woman who went insane. And then he went bankrupt, paying for her medication and her treatment. Talk about bad luck. Oh my gosh, everywhere he turns. But it gets worse. Edwin Booth had a horrible tragedy happen within his own family. His abusive father wasn't enough. His younger brother would go on to assassinate the President of the United States, John Wilkes Booth. You've heard that name, huh? He assassinated Abraham Lincoln. What made it very painful for Edwin Booth was that he loved Lincoln. He was pro-union, he was pro-patriot, and for his own family member to disgrace and embarrass the family by killing the President of the United States, what would you think? Toby, what would you say to, to your community? Hi, you know, I'm related to Joe and he just killed the President. It would be horrible. You wouldn't want to go out in public. But you know what? Don't discount the Holy Spirit. Look what the Holy Spirit did to him. One day, Edwin Booth was in Jersey City, New Jersey, getting ready to perform. There was a large crowd assembled upon his arrival, and he saw a tall young man being kind of herded through the crowd. And he noticed this for a moment, then he realized that they were hurting and pushing this guy. He was being gradually pushed towards this embankment, which was right next to a railroad track. He heard a train coming, he heard the whistle of the train, he saw this man being pushed in the direction of this oncoming train. So he quickly dropped his books and his bag, and he ran over and he snatched this man just in the nick of time and spared him from certain death from this steaming locomotive. They both fell back, hit the ground, as they were dusting themselves off this man, this very tall young man, recognized Edwin Booth from pictures he had seen. And he said, well, thank you, Mr. Booth. That sure was a close call. The man whom he saved, are you ready for this? The oldest son of Abraham Lincoln, Robert Todd Lincoln. Talking about the Holy Spirit. All the shame, all the hurt was made right thanks to the Spirit. And let me give you one more example. This one's almost real time. It happened around 6.38 yesterday evening in the back of this church. I was greeting people as they were coming out, but I noticed during the time I was doing the sermon and telling these stories, there was a man who was kind of tall, like Tom Smurl back there, maybe a little bit tall, a young kid. He looked to be in his 20s, and I thought, I'd never seen him before. I wonder who he is. And so he was sitting there, and he'd smile from time to time, and so as they were coming back, the people were coming out of church, I was greeting. So this gentleman comes up to me, and he obviously is a head taller than me. And he looks down at me and he says, hi, Father Sobis. I said, will you call me Father Jim? He, I said, who are you? He said, my name's Brandon. And I said, are you in medical school or what, what, what are you in? He said, no, I'm a sophomore at St. Joe Catholic High School. I said, oh, okay. He said, can I talk with you for a few minutes? And I said, sure. 
So we went back in the sacristy together. Are you ready for this? He sat across from me, he looked me directly in the eyes, and he said, Father Jim, I have a burning desire to become a Roman Catholic priest. Whoa. You know the last time somebody came out of church and said, I have a burning desire to be a Roman Catholic priest? Not in my lifetime. Now there's one little itsy bitsy problem. He happens to be a Methodist right now. <laughs> But I told him, we'll take care of that. No problem. No problem. So he's going to be in the RCIA this fall. Who would have thunk, I would have never thunk, that a 16-year-old kid who looked like he's 22 would have come out of church and said, I have a burning desire. That's a quote, to be a Roman Catholic priest. And so when I look at the news and I hear about how our president and his administration are trying to destroy our religious li liberties here in this country, when I look at all the stories about pedophilia and all those kind of things going on in the church, you know, many times you just put your head down and you say, Lord, when is it going to stop? When's it going to change? And this kid comes out and says, I have a burning desire to be a Catholic priest. That's how the Holy Spirit works. That's how it works. But you know, my brothers and sisters, to recognize the Spirit, you have to do what the apostles did. You gotta humble yourself. Because our lives are too polluted. Our egos are too big. We have too much stuff that entertains us. How can you know the Holy Spirit's working if you're all caught up in everything else? So let us pray in a very special way that as we anticipate the Feast of Pentecost, we may pray as the early church prayed. Vene Create Spiritu. Come Holy Spirit. Make us humble and fill us up with the power of your love.